welcome to Working Better Together. Today we chat with Richard Schotten, author of Choice Factory and founder of Astro10. Hey Richard, how are you doing? Very good, nice to meet you. Good and you man, good. And, uh, what have you been up to today? Uh, so beginning of the day I've just dropped my uh, kids off at school and I am about to start uh, some of my freelance work today. So I do three days a week at Manning Gottlieb, an agency, and then two days a week, my own behavioral consultancy. Okay. So I'm really keen to find out uh, just more about your mm. journey, you know, and, and, and I think your book has had quite a bit of an uptake uh, regarding like uh, uh, behavioral biases, you know. So, so can you tell us more about uh, yourself and your background and how you got, uh, went about writing this book? So in terms of background, i worked as a media planner for ages. In around 2004, I was working for our Department of Health on their Give Blood campaign and trying to encourage people to donate blood. Um, and when I was doing that, I came across a story about what's called the bystander effect. And it's essentially the idea from two psychologists called Bib Latin and John Darley, that if you make a, um, a kind of an appeal for help, the more people you ask, the less likely any one individual is to help you. And they did lots of experiments in the 60s to prove this. And then when I first read about that, that really sparked my interest in social psychology. Because at the time, we were trying to encourage people to give blood. And what we were doing was going out and saying you know, to everyone in the UK, uh, please donate blood. The blood stock's low in England. And just as Darley and Latine suggest, most people were ignoring those ads. So all we did was take their research, apply it very practically to advertising, change the ads very basically, and said instead, you know, blood stocks are low in Birmingham, please donate. Blood stocks are low in Glasgow, please donate. So we regionally tailored the message. And we saw that by getting around this bystander effect problem, we improved the, the results by about 15%. So that hooked me onto behavioral science because I realized it wasn't just this dusty academic subject. It had very practical business applications. So for me, that was around uh, advertising and media. So are you saying that the messaging must be more targeted and not so open-ended? Yeah, it, it, if, if you're asking someone to do something, you know, whether that's at work or in an advert, if you, especially where you're asking them to be altruistic, if you ask everyone, like hundreds of people to give blood or hundreds of people to come and help you for, for a meeting, there is a diffusion of responsibility. Everyone thinks, well, why should I go through the pain, hassle, or time of helping when I know John, Paul, and Sarah have been asked? So if you make the appeal personal, and ideally you'd do it individually. You know, yeah, back yeah. in 2004, we didn't really have that option on radio. Um, we just thought the close thing we could do was tailor it to a town. But if you can make people feel more directly asked, more personally asked, they then take responsibility and are more likely to, to, to come to your aid. I think this uh, a similar thing applies. I mean, I've got this rule with, with emailing, you know, groups, mm. especially at the, at the office, you know, and the moment you say, hi, everyone, yeah. hey, somebody please do this. You know, nobody types it. But if you, uh, even if you just appoint the one person, like, hey, John, would you mind? You see, see everyone else, but if you just target that specific person, he might not take up the responsibility, but he'll delegate to someone else that it's, that it's appropriate to. Is that what you said? Uh, absolutely. I mean, he yeah. at least, it's, I guess it's, it's, it's not magic. I mean, you know, these ads can be ignored. The emails can be ignored. But in that situation, John has to at least consider what he's going to do because he's being directly asked. When you ask everyone, it's easy just not, never even to bother processing the question. Because everyone thinks someone else will take it, take it on. And get it done. Exactly, exactly. And, and tell me, uh, I, I know you, you mentioned quite an interesting statement around um, um, like how this decision-making process can almost like, uh, like influence workplace moves. Can you maybe like touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so the, the book I wrote, The Choice Factory, is primarily aimed at marketers and advertisers and how you influence customers. Mm. But it draws on social psychology and social psychology is just the study of how people make decisions. So whether someone is in the workplace or at home or in the shops, they're just as influenced by these biases. Now I think what's fascinating is there's almost a bigger opportunity for 
people trying to influence their staff or uh, business decision makers because it's less well believed in those areas. So if you're a you know, FMCG, you're a Coca-Cola or you're a, um, a Ford, all those brands know about social psychology. So all your competitors are already applying these biases. So it's quite hard to get competitive advantage. What's interesting is as soon as people start discussing the workplace, they believe that people behave completely rationally. Yet all the evidence shows the bias is just as um, influential. So I think one that's particularly interesting, and this plagues advertising in all sorts of business, is an idea called the, the principal agent problem. So it's an idea by Stephen Ross at the M MIT, mm. uh, professor of finance. And he argued that this thing called the principal agent problem, and it is the divergence of interest between the principal, that is the company, and the agent, that is the employee. So the principal wants to, business wants to maximize profits sustainably and over a long term. The agent, the, uh, sorry, the employee wants to, um, yes, they want to do that, but they're also interested in their, their self-image and their safe career progression. So you often get this strange um, discrepancy of behavior. So in advertising, for example, there is a very well-known a bias called the Prattfall effect that we all book people and products become more appealing if they admit a weakness so I think Marmite admits okay. that people love it Stella that is expensive Guinness you have to wait for it good things come to those who wait even though lots of the best performing brands have used this tactic and there's lots of evidence that it works the average brand or most brands ignore it and one of the explanations has been this principal agent problem that the agent, the employee, doesn't want to um, use this tactic because even though they know it could be successful for the brand, they are worried by deviating from what everyone else does um, that their own job prospects might be might be might be hampered. Oh, okay. oh, so you're saying it makes them feel more insecure or not, you know, not uh, ready for the position? Yeah, ab absolutely. So the, the idea is that. Yeah, um, it is appealing to shoppers and consumers. You know, if yeah. a brand admits a weakness, it makes all their other claims more believable. Um, uh, it explains where maybe a trade-off comes. So there's lots of evidence for the organisation to do it, but the employee also is also interested in their own safe career progression. And then once they start thinking about that, they don't want to deviate from what all their peers are doing because if you have a advertising campaign and it flops or any particular product project and it flops if you've done what your competitors are doing it's very easy to explain it in, 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 to your bosses you know you can say well this was a sensible thing to do company a b and c have all done it uh, well. if you deviate from the norm it's, it's even though it might be the right thing to do, it's harder to explain internally to justify your, your behavior internally. So you end up with these suboptimal decisions uh, from employees. And I mean, where do you think, what do you think leaders and companies can learn from this theory? I mean, the, the whole behavioral biases. Um, so, so, well, in, 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 f f firstly, I think in, in that particular example would be. Um, you know, having a rounded view of how their employees or their customers actually behave. So not subscribing just to a very kind of simplistic view of classical economics and understanding things like the pratfall effects exist and therefore um, it is a logical decision to uh, deviate from the herd and to, to admit weaknesses. Um, so I think, you know, that's the very specific answer. In the, in, in the, in the more broad terms, I think one of the simplest things that companies can do is probably consider how they find out what motivates their employees or what motivates their, their customers. And the, one of the key principles from social psychology and behavioral science is that what people say motivates them and what actually motivates them are very different things. Oh, can you elaborate on them more? Because I'm quite intrigued. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you go out and ask someone, um, uh, how many 
girlfriends they've had or how often they donate to charity. There's something called the sociability, social desirability bias. So they end up answering in a way that makes them look admirable and ethical, not actually uh, ha how they uh, are a fair reflection on how they behave. So th th that's one big problem. Yeah. If you go and ask people a question about the workplace, they'll be thinking, what, how can I, pro how can I project a, a kind of positive image? I portray a, a, bit, a, a, a better version of themselves. Exactly, exactly. They're almost talking about who they want to be rather than what actually yeah. happens. So it gives you the wrong data that you then make decisions on. The second problem is a more insidious one, which is often people don't even know what influences them. It's not even they're lying. It's what psychologists call confabulating. So there's a famous experiment in the UK where a, um, an academic from the University of Leicester, I think it was Hargreaves and North, persuaded a supermarket to alternate the music they played in the wine aisle. So one week it's French music, one week it's German music. And what they found was that the proportion of sales between those two nations flipped massively according to the music that was played. So I can't remember the exact figures, but roughly 80% of the sales of, of wine, you know, if they were French or German, was French when French music played. And it was roughly 70% when it was German music playing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a nice insight into kind of some of the subtle effects that the environment has on it. But what's interesting maybe more for a workplace is when they interviewed people as they were leaving that store, they said to them, look, what influenced you to buy your wine? And only 2% of people mentioned the music. You know, even when they were prompted, they were specifically asked about the music, 86, 87% of them flat out denied the music had anything to do with it. So okay. by setting up a test and control experiment, you see what actually motivates people. But then you see if you ask them, you'll get a completely different set of answers. And my find is, is most businesses um, tend to take survey questions, interviews at, fa at face value, and it takes them down the wrong, wrong path. Um, so it's, are you saying it's almost like doing the things that don't scale and getting a lot more personal with your employees as opposed to taking a generous view? Um, but, I mean, that, 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 thinking about the, the bystander effect, that is a very specific thing. I think if you're asking for help, personal's better. The, 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 the point about the wine experiment was more, if, if you want to know how people behave, think about that type of experimental design. Don't go out and ask people. Set up a test and control methodology in which you observe how people actually behave. Brilliant. And you'll get far more interesting, far more uh, useful results. That's brilliant. So how do you spend your day on average? Uh, so it's a mix. I'm either three days a week at working for a media agency in the UK in London. The other two days, I've just set up a company called Astro 10, which advises companies on um, how they apply behavioral science to their marketing and advertising. And, and your favorite um, uh, reading material, like podcasts or, or even blogs or even books? Yeah, so, um, so Twitter, I find, is a great source of information. There's loads of interesting social psychologists or advertisers on there. So I follow people like Dave Trock. I think he's brilliant just for a, uh, a creative thinking approach. Um, I'm a big fan of more or less which is a Tim Harford podcast about statistics and, and numbers and how they're often abused. So those, I think, are the two, two of my favourites. Okay, and, um, and how can people reach out to you? Uh, so Twitter's probably the best way. Okay. Um, my handle's at rshotton, S-H-O-T-T-O-N. Uh, and then I, you know, just DM me if there are any questions. Cool. And, and tell me, what, what is your favourite like, productivity tool or software that you use every day? Um, I, well... Favorite productivity tool is probably books. So I find the simplest ways to come up with ideas for new experiments, read lots of psychology books, and then just constantly be thinking, well, how can those experiments be applied to uh, businesses and brands? Brilliant. And then tell me, just to like end off with the book, um, can you tell us maybe just more about the book and and some of the insights from it that's come out? Yeah, sure, sure. So the, the book's called The Choice Factory, and the idea is to follow a single person through the day. They make 25 decisions, um, and uh, uh, 
each of those decisions, so things like, should I give money to a beggar? Should I hire someone at a job? Uh, should I have red wine or white wine? I explain why they made that decision with reference to a famous psychology experiment. Mm. So that's done in about a quarter of the chapter. Then about another third of the chapter is, here are some experiments that I have done which show this works as a, in commercial situations. And then the final part of the book is, look, now you know about these biases. Now you know they still work today. What should you, um, what should you do, do differently? Brilliant. So it's a quite a practical guide. Um, and is, is it almost like, a, is, it a, is it a book that you can almost work through? Is it almost like a workbook that you can keep forever, you know, and, and ch- almost like a checklist for yourself as well? Yeah, so to so keep forever, definitely. It's meant to be very practical. I mean, there's lots of other books on, um, social psychology and behavioral science but there aren't many about applying to advertising and there aren't many that I think pull out well what should you do differently now you know it mm-hmm. um, and also there's a lot of them that just focus on the same old biases what I've tried to do is um, uh, go and find ones that have been less well uh, right. discussed but one actually, actually one, one of them that you mentioned some of the interesting findings, I think one that's particularly interesting to workplaces is one called negative social proof. So there's a very well-known bias called social proof. Okay. It's the idea that we copy the behavior of others, we follow what we think is a popular course of action. So that's very, very well known. Yeah. What's interesting is the inverse of that is true. So, or, or it can be used, it can be off, it is often used to, to the wrong effect. And that's called negative social proof. So if you go out and tell people that a unwanted course of behavior is commonplace, it removes any sense of, of transgression. It becomes more commonplace still. So all the research around this is by a guy called Cialdini at the University of Arizona. We can go into that if you wanted. But what happens often in companies is, let's say people aren't filling in their expenses or they haven't um, filled in their timesheets. Yeah. You get these angry emails from the, uh, the CEO saying, only 5% of you have done this. Yeah. What he obviously wants to do is shock people into behaving in a, in a set way. What people take out of it is, oh, no one else has bothered doing it. So obviously it's an important thing. Why should I? So it's almost so, done the reverse. Yeah, it has an absolutely reverse effect. And yeah. children has done some brilliant uh, experiments, putting up CCTV camera uh, and watching rates of theft and showing when it is made clear that lots of people are stealing, more stealing happens. When he just says, don't steal, it's wrong, stealing goes down. So tell people that uh, lots of people drink, more people, you know, lots of students are getting drunk, more students will then get drunk. Tell people that lots of youths are carrying knives, you'll end up encouraging more youths to carry knives. Again and again and again, uh, I think governments and businesses get this, get this insight wrong. That's incredible. I mean, so, so your suggestion there is, you know, like your typical scenario, like, like you mentioned, I think ad agencies have got this age old problem of our timesheets, you know, with yeah, you know, yeah. of people filling them in. Um, what is just your, your suggested messaging oh. there is maybe more of a personal message or? So, 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 uh, yes and no. So it doesn't have to be um, tailored by name, but I think yeah. you do a few things. Firstly, you would say uh, you would flip it, you know, We've got more people than ever are, are filling their tie sheets. Tw- you know, fifty percent more than last week. Done it. You, you, you know, you don't make this stuff up, but you can cut the data to find yeah. deposit stories. You can talk about the momentum. The, the thing that I think the U.S. sorry, the U.K. government have done, which is useful here, is there is a big problem of doctors here prescribing antibiotics too regularly. I think that's in many countries. So rather than go out and say lots of doctors doing this is a problem for all sorts of reasons, resistance, bacterial resistance, uh, etc. What they did was pick the bottom 10% of doctors, the worst 10%, the highest over prescribers. Mm. They went out and told them, look, you are doing much worse than the uh, average. And that had a very significant uh, effect on their behavior. So the same thing would be with you know, timesheets. You can apply the same behavior there. Don't go and tell everyone, not many people are doing their timesheets, pick out the worst offenders and tell them that they are doing less well than the average and they will change their behavior. Lots and lots of evidence for that. Uh, you know, I find like t- t- a similar thing as well as uh, the, the biggest thing we've seen in the workplace is, especially with recognition and appreciation, is that why most people, Ooh, yeah. 
Yeah, why most people love yeah. high five is because it doesn't require the top down recognition. It's quite bottom up. Like anyone can mm. recognize anyone. You know? And the biggest thing is whenever we see enga our engagement is usually about 80, 90% on the platform for, them, for most companies. And whenever we see the engagement drop, it's usually the biggest thing we notice is that management aren't engaging, you know, and appreciate mm. staff. Mm. And staff won't engage when management aren't engaging because they, they don't want to be involved in something that, 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 that the leaders oh. aren't doing. Yeah. Because they know that there are all sorts of flavors of the month that companies, every company is slightly screwed up in certain ways and someone will get excited about something for, for two weeks and then it'll fade away. And I think often employees are looking around trying to work out, is this a big change that's going to happen and I need to adopt it or is this something that's going to be gone next week? If the leaders and the management aren't showing interest and uh, involvement, people will think, I'm just going to sit this one out. So yeah, I think that, that, that makes absolutely, uh, absolute sense. The other area that you might be fascinated by, um, there's all sorts of stuff around the danger of financial incentives. Okay. Okay. That if you try and motivate staff with bonuses and uh, additional cash payments, things normally spot, uh, have, have unintended consequences. So the idea is if there is a sliver of difference between uh, the, ins the, the, the behavior you reward and the actual underlying behavior you want, um, people will, they'll game the system. They will hit the specified target, but they won't deliver the underlying um, uh, be desired behavior. It's a famous example in the UK is there was a, a mandate from the government that all hospitals would be judged on whether they managed to see people in accident and emergency departments within four hours. So rather than dealing with the complex problem, which was uh, speeding up the way that you serve people or treat them, what many hospitals did was not admit people. So the ambulances would be parked up outside with patients in it. And the clock only started once those patients were admitted into the um, oh actual hospital goodness. itself. <laughs> so they they looked like they were hitting the, uh, the, the the targets, but they weren't actually improving patient outcomes as, as hopeful. And that's a massive problem with these more uh, direct attempts at creating a positive culture or direct attempts of using money to make people do things. You end up with the specific uh, outcome yeah that you've asked for not the not not the, not the actual behavior you want so can we just touch base on that because that's a, that's a mm. really uh, i mean so what do you suggest in that circumstance you know like is, is it not going financial i mean what or, 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 you know and being specific it sounds like you, you're mentioning don't be strict that straightforward on financial outcomes or yeah finan I, th I think the there's, a, there's, there's, there's two separate things. There's, there's, there's the danger of um, setting financial targets and also very specific um, uh, targets like that eight minute. You know, there wasn't a financial involvement for the NHS. There would have been kind of kudos instead. I think the, the, the area is a lot of business problems are, are, are complex and multifaceted. If you try and boil it down to a single metric you often end up with problems and and some of the then there must be a counterbalance to the metric which is you have to sometimes trust the expertise and judgment of people who have built up knowledge in an area um, if you move too far away from that you get all sorts of the unintended consequences we've talked about well that's incredible but deep <laughs> <laughs> So, um, oh, well, listen, I know we're running out of time. So, um, yes, yeah. Yeah. So, well, thanks a lot for joining us today. Um, so, the, I guess the audience can reach out on Twitter. You mentioned the, the details already. Or, or and, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah LinkedIn yeah. as well. Yeah. And we'll, um, we'll, we'll leave a lot of these show notes in the, in the podcast. That'll be amazing. Cool. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, thank you very much. Cheers. 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 Give me a high five. Okay, cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye.